rescuing the reefs. And you may ask, what is a reef and why does it need to be rescued or does it deserve to be rescued at all? Here's an image of a typical tropical coral reef. They're incredibly complex, incredibly diverse uh, uh, forms of life with an incredible density of fish and coral species. They only occupy about a tenth of a percent of the world's ocean floor, but they're home to about a quarter of all the world's ocean species. They're just absolutely remarkable places. And if you ever get a chance to dive on a reef, your, your mind will be open completely just to how wonderful they are. In this image, you see uh, some of the most densely populated uh, fish um, concentrations in the world. Um, and you also see coral. Coral are incredible animals. For the longest time in natural history, people actually classified coral based upon the dead coral skeletons they left behind. People oftentimes when they hear coral, they think, oh, that's like a kind of rock. When in fact, it's a form of life. And not only is it a form of life, people thought it was a plant for a very long time. We now understand that they're animals. And they're incredibly complex animals. Within every cell of every coral, there lives algae. It's called zooxanthellae. And that algae takes carbon dioxide waste from the animal, the coral polyp itself, and sunlight from the sky, and it creates energy. And the excess energy created by the, cor by the uh, algae is uh, food for the coral. Coral get about 80% of their energy from the algae that lives within their bodies. And in turn, the coral provide a home for the algae, and the coral build structure. They build reef. These little tiny animals, it takes an incredible amount of time, but they end up building enormous structures around the world. In fact, they're some of the best architects known to man. Here's a map showing location of the world's reefs. Uh, they're common in the South Pacific Ocean in shallow waters, and reefs occupy places where the water is very clear, very low in nutrient, and uh, very bright light, between about 20 degrees south latitude and 20 degrees north latitude. The largest reef you may be familiar with is the Great Barrier Reef off the northeast coast of Australia. Uh, there's also reefs in, off the coast of India, in the Red Sea, in the Persian Gulf, um, off the western coast of Africa. Closer to home, there are reefs around the Caribbean. And the Caribbean reefs are commonly built around old volcanic uh, structures in what we uh, typically call the Caribbean. But even closer to home, there are reefs off the coast of Florida, off the west coast of the, the Florida Keys. Also, Hawaii has a number of reefs that are very, very beautiful. Now you might ask, well, why am I speaking about this here in Williamsport, Pennsylvania? I don't see any red in the middle of Pennsylvania at all. Uh, we can bring the reefs to life uh, in captivity. We can create reef aquariums. Uh, let me go back to Florida for just a moment. Uh, the Florida Keys, the islands that make up the Florida Keys, those were built by coral. If you go to Key West and you're standing on land, you're standing on a structure that very, very, very tiny animals built very slowly over time. And I brought a part of that with me today. This is rock from uh, inland in Florida. This is quarried from on land, and I'll be talking about it later on today. You can't imagine how much time and effort it takes coral to build this, let alone an entire, uh, an entire island. So here is an image of a typical um, reef aquarium kept by hobbyists. And uh, I'm really here to talk to you about reef aquariums and their role in education. So you know a little bit about reefs, and what we try to do in reef aquariums is replicate a natural coral reef in a box made out of glass. So you take a glass aquarium, fill it with salt water, provide the proper conditions under which coral can not only grow, but grow faster than they even can in, in the ocean. And for a long time, um, reef aquarium hobbyists were under attack by environmentalists, where we say, oh, you go to the reefs and you take all the fish and you take all the coral and it causes destruction. And for a little bit, that was kind of true. We've gotten to a point now where we can actually give back to the oceans. We've gotten so good at developing uh, the techniques in our hobby that we're able to help repopulate the oceans that we've originally kind of taken from. These reef aquariums have rock structure that provide uh, uh, filtration. They have uh, diverse fish from all around the world. They have beautiful coral. They have all kinds of different little critters running around inside them. Uh, a lot of time, maybe 20 or 30 years ago or even further, if anybody tried to keep coral and fish alive in aquariums, it often they could sustain the life for a while and eventually they died. And it turns out that it's very difficult to keep fish alive. If only one-tenth of one percent of the world's oceans have coral, and there's water everywhere, we're really a water planet, it really must require very special conditions. And in a lot of ways, the aquarium hobbyists have taught the oceanographers 
and the biologists, the wildlife biologists, about what it's necessary to keep the reefs alive. So um, in a reef, you have other relationships, relationships between fish and coral. This is a gold striped maroon clown living within the body of a, uh, a leather coral, and you see the individual polyps coming up. It's another beautiful relationship where the fish has like a little home, a safe, a safe place to be. It provides fanning for the coral and food for the coral. It's a beautiful relationship. And in the movie like Finding Nemo, we learn about uh, clownfish and anemones and their relationships. But coral are just beautiful things to see. In the home aquarium, you have these very, very bright colors and different types of structures. We even name coral for things that we know, like this anchor or hammer coral because of the shape of the polyps on the end. Or this we call a brain coral because of its similarity to like what a brain looks like. And other very uh, beautiful and colorful individual coral polyps. Um, some coral build structures that go out to actually shade coral, uh, living below them in kind of competition. But this is a type of coral here that is what we call a stony coral. It builds solid structure. So most all of what you see there is, it's actually like potato chip. It's like a Pringles chip, kind of growing out. It's like a growing potato chip. The surface, the brown things, those are the actual coral polyps living. And at the edge, the edge is purple. That's where the growth is happening. The coral actually builds exoskeleton. It goes out in front and says, I'm going to build a little bit of me and then grow on top of that. Um, the reefs need to be rescued right now because we have changed our planet in many ways. Adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere makes the oceans more acidic. It increases the carbonic acid concentration in the ocean. Rising ocean levels and rising ocean temperatures have put a lot of pressure on coral. It's not just the aquarium hobbyists who've taken from the reefs. It's also our behavior as people. So our job here in central Pennsylvania is just as big as the job of people who live in Indonesia, where they fish directly on the reef. We have to be careful about how we influence our environment. So what we do is we build uh, reef aquariums and put them in schools as educational tools, not only so students can learn about the reefs, but we've been able to do something very remarkable, and that's create reefs from um, almost nothing in a way. We're able to take uh, rock that's dry, where we've gathered it from inland, and we've been able to grow coral and propagate fish and create a brand new aquarium, having taken nothing from the ocean at all. These are examples of two reef aquariums here in Pennsylvania. Actually, the one on the left is located about 20 miles from here, and the one on the right is located about 30 miles from here, and they're in teacher classrooms. Some other examples include relatively large aquariums. Uh, the, one, the two on the top, or the one on the top and the one on the bottom are about four miles from here. They're 300 and 125 gallon aquariums. And oftentimes, oh, and this is another pair of aquariums that are interconnected. The one on the left is an older aquarium. In a way, it has uh, lived for a long time, and it has all the little critters and bacteria living within the live rock that help give it great life. The aquarium on the right is new, and it's interconnected. And by adding dry rock, or rock that's quarried from inland, not from the ocean, and by cutting pieces of coral from one aquarium and putting it in the other, we create two aquariums in a way from one. And students, uh, they, we've talked a lot in a way today about how students learn and about good education. And when you put a kid in front of a reef aquarium, they can spend hours and hours and hours and days just looking at the beautiful interactions between the animals and the coral, between the sponge, which cleans the between the sponge and the water, which cleans the water, uh, between how the coral behaves as the light cycle throughout the day changes, about changes in the water chemically. And you can just spend an enormous amount of time uh, as a learning tool. You don't actively teach by saying, oh, here's a textbook, read some things and memorize it. But you just put them in front, and they make those great observations, and they make great conclusions, and they can do wonderful experiments on aquariums. They also learn about how complex it is to recreate what the Earth does for the reefs. So oftentimes these reef aquarium systems have very complex systems that you have to design. And a student has to figure out a way where you can take pumps and pipes and light bulbs and electricity and recreate what the earth does and the sun does for coral on a natural reef. It's a very complex engineering problem. In a way, you have to be a plumber and an electrician and a carpenter and a glass cutter and all kinds of different things. And students who see the coral grow also take part in um, reproducing coral for 
growth in other tanks. So here we have some students who have taken large coral colonies and we cut them. And it's rock, so you have to use bone cutters and shears and um, all kinds of different cutting devices. You cut small pieces of coral and you super glue it onto a little piece of rock or you super glue it on a piece of ceramic. And all of these are individual little cuttings from larger coral colonies. And each of them on their own will grow to be much larger over time. And it really doesn't take very much time these days. Uh, these individual little fragments, we call, we call them frags, little coral frags, we can have remarkable growth rates, faster growth rates in captivity than we even see in the ocean. Here's another example of some smaller ones that have grown up a little bit from the initial cuttings. So here's an example of what we do in schools. This is a 125 gallon aquarium that was established about four years ago. And I just want you to get a sense as to the overall look of the aquarium. There's a lot of empty space. There's a lot of not much in the upper two thirds of the tank. And I promise you that I haven't changed anything here. So this tank has some rock and it has some coral. And then what I'm going to do is advance the slide one more step. This is the aquarium two years later. It's significantly grown in. And we haven't taken anything from the ocean. We've provided a valuable educational learning tool and we're able to cut pieces and grow new aquariums from scratch. So the other way that we take care of this problem is about providing uh, good filtration. And good filtration, the key is having good, what we call live rock. So this rock that I brought again today, there's a pile of it you see in the left-hand side of the picture. It's kind of all sort of stacked up and it was just put in the tank uh, like this. This is just from inland in Florida. It turns out that if you live in the Keys and you want a below ground swimming pool, you can't just dig a hole in your backyard because your whole backyard is this stuff. So you have to blast it away. And uh, oftentimes it's used for fill, but we can uh, use this where it was originally coral. It has the perfect structure, lots of little holes for sponges and little tube worms and the right bacteria that help to clean the water. So this is put in the aquarium along with other uh, rock that we consider to be live rock or good rock, excellent filtration and a good foundation for the coral to grow on. Now the perspective is going to be a little bit different here, but that pile of rock you see in the center of this image is now the pile of rock that's right in the center of the tank just behind the bluefish, like Dory from Nemo. So it's a pile of rock and now it's covered with coralline algae. Coralline algae shows good growth in the tank. It shows a healthy tank. And this is about a year after the original picture and then this is a year after that. So in two years the coral has grown and grown and grown. And we're able to take this coral, cut it from one tank, and put it in a new tank. So this is the first tank, it turns out, that was created entirely in our program from nothing taken from the ocean. All of the rock was um, quarried inland. All of the coral is cut from coral that we previously had in tanks. Uh, the two clownfish in the picture were, were captively bred. The entire thing you see in this tank had no reliance on removing anything from the ocean. So we're able to create a little bit of the ocean, put it in a classroom, and use it as an incredible educational tool. Students can see the interaction of the coral, watch how it grows in different directions, watch how the shape morphs over time, see how the coral growth grows down on the rock and grows up in its shape, watch the interaction of the fish and the coral together. We're able to take anemone, this is a bubble tip anemone down in the, in the bottom section of the picture, and they'll split for us on their own as well. And they're incredible, they're beautiful little animals. It's actually an in one individual little animal. And one last example, this is an aquarium that uh, we set up very recently. Not only is it a completely sustainable aquarium, but it's also lit with LED lights, the light emitting diodes, which are incredibly efficient. You see, it doesn't make a lot of sense to make an aquarium and then have to use massive amounts of electricity to operate it, because that eventually just dumps carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which eventually hurts the reefs. So we're able to have very efficient operating systems that are very, very beautiful, they're fun to look at, and they provide like a cornerstone for education. Uh, we know that students learn best by doing science, not just by reading about science. And it turns out that a reef aquarium uh, can be the cornerstone, the centerpiece of education in science classrooms. It gives students a sense of ownership whenever they take part in maintaining the aquariums and building new aquariums. It's just a very, very exciting thing. I'm very proud of it and happy to share it with you today. So thank you very much. <laughs>